Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Perfect RIA Podcast, What Works Wednesday edition. I am your host, Matthew Jarvis, and with me today, uh, an advisor who's been a friend now for several years, a member of our Invictus coaching program. And today we're going to talk about how uh, Chris has implemented surge in his practice, how extreme accountability that I've been able to watch has made a big difference. And so, Chris, welcome to the show. Thank you. Uh, Great to be here. Wonderful. Why don't, let's kick off. Why don't you tell the nation, which is now some like 60,000 downloads a month strong, tell the nation well, about your practice, uh, where you're located in the country, what you've kind of been up to, and then we'll jump into talking about Surge. Uh, sure. Uh, I got into the business in 1996. I am uh, currently in Derry, New Hampshire, and I've been here for uh, well, 20 years now. And um, I'm part of a Hybrid RIA, uh, Integrated Financial Partners. Uh, we uh, partner with primarily LPL as the broker dealer, and um, we got about a right now about 180 clients, but uh, working on making some changes on that. So that's it's exciting times. That is exciting times. Well, you've made a lot of uh, big changes and improvements over your in your practice the last couple of years that we've known each other. And of course, Surge being one of those. So tell us a little bit about implementing Surge, how Surge looks today, uh, things that you wish you would have done 10 years ago, whatever it might be. Yeah. So um, the thing that got me about Surge was uh, I started implementing it at the uh, first summer of COVID. That's right, when yeah. I had to change a lot of the way I was doing things. Right. And so yeah. uh, uh, nothing like necessity being the mother of invention. But um, heard you guys talking about it. And I said, well, let's give it a try and see what happens. And what it allowed me to do that I didn't really foresee at the beginning was really focus uh, my service uh, the way I was servicing clients. And so what I was able to do was really niche down and provide more and more value to a smaller group of people. Um, But it made me a lot more valuable to those people. And so I have been, uh, especially this year, in the process of um, trying to figure out uh, where I'm going to go from here as far as working with clients. But what I'm in the process right now of is reducing my total client count um, from about 180 to about 100. And really, I've been able to do that because of Surge, uh, just focusing on a different aspect um, of client's service every quarter. But this allows me to make sure that I'm touching all the bases and I'm able to go a little bit deeper each meeting because I only have one primary thing on the agenda to talk about. This allows me to answer their questions. And I've got a few other things that I'm touching on. But like, for example, this session, it's uh, what I call your lifetime tax bill. How do we reduce that? Right. And so tax planning just by a different name. But that's really the thing. So we talk about Roth conversions. We talk about uh, is it a good year to exercise some gains that uh, because you can do it at the zero percent rate. Um, other ideas as well, donor advised funds, QCDs, all those fun topics. But it allows us to go deep because that's the only thing I'm really focused on outside of um, the normal questions that they're going to have. Chris, so on that focus with, with lifetime tax bill, and I, and I love that position, right? It, it resonates with clients more than comprehensive tax planning or some, some other name. Uh, has that been thwarted at all or derailed at all with the market conditions, right? I mean, if you, you went in ready for tax planning, but now the markets are doing whatever they're doing, are you still just saying, hey, great, welcome in and let's jump into tax planning? Yeah, so it's not really been a problem. The first topic, um, so I send out like a five point agenda ahead of time. And the first thing that we were always talking about is, do you have enough money? And I phrase that different way each, uh, each cycle, but I always want to make sure that we at least touch on it. And I phrase it differently because I just want the clients to think about, I know everybody thinks differently. And so sometimes if I phrase it differently, um, it might resonate with some person more than another. So I know for you, this would be guardrails. For Micah, this is going to be buckets. But it's basically answering that same question. And I'm typically opening the meeting with the comment of, I know statements are ugly. So we're definitely going to talk about that. And then but this is where we are and this is how market cycles go and we're prepared for this and we've got enough money and uh, cash and bonds to ride through this. This is what a normal bear market looks like. The one that happened in 2000 was exceptionally short, right? It's, it's, it's great. You didn't sell then, but you know, do you sell now? Right. Is that the, is that really the yeah. thing? And so that's been able to keep most clients um, from uh, bogging down the conversation. You know, we haven't gotten focused too much on that. We're able to answer the question and then move on to some other things that are pertinent in their lives. 
Chris, I love that you jump right into this. I know statements are ugly, right? So that you're not leading with, let me sugarcoat it. Let me hope you don't ask, or let's talk about something else, right? Let's just address the elephant in the room. Statements are ugly. And then let's do some perspective. And then here's the action we're going to take. Yeah, exactly. Tell me, pivoting just a little bit, tell me if you will about about graduating clients, right? So you're going from about 180 relationships down to about a, a hundred. That That's probably one of the most difficult things to do in a practice, right? I've, I've helped advisors make a lot of changes in a lot of practice. I've made a lot of changes in my own. Things like surge and value adds, that's one thing. Reducing your client count, that's, a, that's work. Yeah, uh, probably the hardest thing I have had to do since being in this business. And um, so come back to the mastermind in the spring. Yeah. And this was my extreme accountability was to, you know, really identify who I should be working with and who I was really providing value to. And so, um, you know, I got a, uh, I got my extreme accountability, which was people had to meet certain requirements and be at a certain billing level, uh, those types of items. And um, I spent most of the summer um, negotiating with myself, if you will, but, uh, you know, who, how am I going to tell this person? And, um, what I really had to come to, to grips with is, um, I didn't have the time to do everything for everybody and not everybody could afford the, um, the total cost of, of being a client. So in other words, by the time I pay my staff and everybody else, um, some of these clients I, I was losing money on. And, and I didn't personally, I didn't mind that. But um, Stephanie Bogan's got the conversation about, you know, imagine all your clients are in a room yes. and yeah. everybody's at a table and uh, somebody, you know, everybody thanked that person that just paid the bill for everybody else. And that was the thing that uh, really convicted me that I cannot uh, keep these clients and have somebody else pay their freight, right? Like that was, that was really the problem that, uh, that I couldn't get around. Uh, so uh, I spent a lot of time over the summer. I found two other advisors that I could transition the clients to. And I honestly believe that they're going to take better care of them than I will because they're at a different place in their yeah. practice. They're at a different point. Um, and what they're able to do is devote more time for what they need instead of, having them go through a bunch of other exercises that they maybe don't need. Like some of them are in a lower tax bracket and they don't really, their, their lifetime tax bill is pretty minimal. And so that's not really a productive yeah. conversation. I loved what you mentioned, Chris, about kind of working through negotiating with yourself, right? It's almost like I've got to find a lens where I'm more uncomfortable staying still than I am uncomfortable making the change. And looking, like you said, at that example of, are my top clients subsidizing my lower clients? And of course, that's always best done by removing names and just looking at revenue. I have this one client that pays me $400 a year out of another client paying me $38,000 a year. They're getting roughly the same thing. That doesn't quite add up. Yeah, it, uh, that was tough, right? And if a client had ever asked me about it, I, what do you say, right? Because I would have had nothing to say. Yeah, yeah. So Now, so someone listening could say, well, hey, I've never had a client ask and nobody's ever going to ask and you could justify it away. And that's not really the point here. The point is, as you said, I don't have time to deliver massive value to all these clients the way that I feel is right. Someone else will be better suited for that. And this is kind of the lens, this lens of subsidizing in your case, is what will get me to take action. And I think that's really the key is you're getting your up level in your practice. Well, it was that and the extreme accountability. Without that, I, I would have just punted the thing because I've been punting it for years. You know, when I look back, I, I can easily look back and say I've been doing this for at least five years and probably longer. Some of these clients have been around for 10 years yeah. and, you know, happy to happy to service them, but not um, I couldn't keep the same level of planning. And I've tried to have two service models in the past. It doesn't work well for me. It's, no. you know, other people can probably do it, but it wasn't my thing. And when I think about what I wanted to do, do going forward, it wasn't a good fit. I love learning and I love the idea of, you know, uh, there's that old saying, you know, if you if you stand still, you kind of fall behind. And, and yeah. so you either need to increase or, or you need to kind of figure out that you're that you're not. And I think that uh, in order to, you know, still be in the game 10 years from now, we're going to have to keep growing, keep leveling up our service. And I want to I want to make sure that I'm on that on that ladder where we're just kind of building and building and, and being more valuable to clients. And and that way I don't have to worry about, you know, fee compression or, or any of those types of things. And that was the other thing that went along with it was I had to raise fees on certain clients. And so, yeah, that's a fun conversation when um, markets are down. But when markets are down. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. just uh, I just recorded an episode uh, just a, a minute ago before we recorded ours. 
and we're talking to an advisor who had made a giant practice change right in the middle of COVID, right? Um, and so there's always this reason, right? Anytime you're planning, whether you think that's uni the universe or a higher power, whatever that may be, someone is going to test your resolve, right? If you say, hey, I'm going to raise my fees, you, you can just guarantee the markets are going to fall, right? If you can say, hey, I'm going to, I'm going to graduate a certain number of clients. You can just guarantee that client's going to reach out to you and tell you how much they love you and how you make a difference in their lives and how they couldn't imagine this without you. And then you still have to proceed on. Yeah, absolutely. And without the extreme accountability, I'm sure I would have punted. I'd have been like, yep, uh, well, we'll do this again next year. You know, we'll pick this, we'll pick this project up again. We'll just punt on it. Um, but I've got until 1231 to make certain things happen. And so there I am. And they will happen. <laughs> yes, they yes. will happen. Uh, but there's a lot, and I've talked about a lot on this podcast, extreme accountability, which, and again, kudos to Micah for thinking that up. I still remember the mastermind years ago when he and I were doing this just with each other. And, and he says, well, Jarvis, you know, if you're going to do this thing, if you're going to raise your fees, then then it doesn't matter if we put a little skin in the game. And Christopher, you've seen, Chris, you've seen Micah go about this several times. And if you ever think Micah's having a casual conversation with you about your practice, like he is setting the trap, you know, tell me, just tell me how much is like the average client work worth to you. And if you hear those words, you know, you need to run or yeah. buckle up because it's going to transform your life. Buckle up. <laughs> no doubt. No doubt. Of course, this isn't your first extreme accountability. So you've, you've been to this, this table before. Yeah, this is my third one. And, um, you know, the, the other two, relatively speaking, were, were quite a bit easier. Uh, I can't imagine doing anything harder than, um, you know, separating with the, with the 80 or so that I am. I mean, it, it just emotionally, it was one of the more difficult things I've had to do. And I don't, it's just not the way I normally think about the business. But, uh, but, but yeah, when it was, you know, this this person and you've known them 20 years and you know their kids and you know all those different types of things those that becomes a, a difficult conversation to have but knowing that it was better for them in the long run is really what allowed me to to do it yeah no that's a good point as i mentioned earlier in this episode right graduating clients is perhaps the hardest thing that you can do to transform your practice raising fees is not easy right leaving uh from one platform to another that's not easy uh, hiring another team member, that's not easy. Graduating clients, that's probably the hardest one. Yeah, I would definitely agree with that. Well, let's um, let's pivot just a little bit back to surge meetings. Would you mind telling us, Chris, just a little bit about how your surge cycle works now? So you mentioned your agenda, and I love this focus on, hey, do you have enough money? I love that you jumped right into, hey, statements are ugly. But could you tell us just kind of logistically, how does a surge cycle work for you? Uh, you know, your fall or spring surge, however you're doing that. Yeah, so... Um, I each time it does morph a little bit, but um, basically the, the way this one went was um, September, we sent out invites uh, to all clients <clears throat> and they have a, it's uh we have a web thing where they basically sign up themselves, uh, made it easy. Always have the question in there. Is there anything you would like to add to the agenda? Have some prep work that one of my assistants does. Um, they mail that out the about 10 days before the meeting so in other words the client gets a printed agenda they get several statements that i want them to see uh, pretty much everything i plan to go over in a meeting a couple of pieces from jp morgan guide to the markets Always a um yeah but one of the things i'd found was that um especially in zoom meetings is that sometimes people will be trying to look at these things on their phone and i'm like yeah uh, that's impossible right at least for me it's impossible i don't know if and a lot of them couldn't do it so if they get the packet ahead of time, it gives them a chance to review things. Um, it allows them to know exactly what we're talking about. There's no hiding from the statement, right? They, they've had a full week, at least, uh, maybe not always a week, but close to it, a week to review it and know if, you know, just how painful it's going to be. Um, and then what happens is about uh, uh, a little bit less than a week before, uh, my other uh, admin calls and just confirms the meeting and again asks the question, is there anything you want to add to the agenda? Um, then we have the, the meeting, we go over everything and then the following <clears throat> week, excuse me, um, I dictate a debrief and that usually has some portions of follow-up and they, the staff may or may not have to contact the client for it. But then the, um, um, roughly the following week, my other admin, again, uh, Vicky will call the clients and just say, um, Hey, uh, these are the things you talked about. This is what was supposed to happen. This has happened so far. Lynn's going to send you a doctor's sign, you know, whatever the, whatever the follow-up pieces are. 
And sometimes there's uh, there's a couple of clients that didn't get us their tax return ahead of time. And so she would, hey, can you please send that in? You know, that uh, it really helps us provide more value. And some of the clients that didn't at the beginning will, you know, after we have the meeting or in between me and uh, be between the meeting and then uh, Vicky reaching out to them, uh, they'll provide it. Sure. And so then I just do a, a quick write up, you know, put it somewhere in my schedule where I'm going to review it, write it up. Um, we I use Holista Plan um, as a report and I always make sure I send that to the clients just so that they know we actually did something with the return, right? This was, it wasn't me, you know, checking a box somewhere, but um allowing them to know where everything stands. Um, I love the observations in there. And I tell them, I said, this is the observations are put out by a piece of artificial intelligence. Um, it's great for me to just have a quick once over of, you know, this is where everything is. Uh, this is things that you might want to pay attention to. And these are things that you might be able to do. Some of them don't make sense. Um, but that, that's all right. That's what AI is not perfect. And this tells me this is why you don't go to a robo advisor, right? You know, AI is not perfect. That. Yeah. That's so, awesome. it, and then there's any, you know, any follow up from that, but uh, that's kind of the, that's the general agenda. Well, I like that. What really stands out to me on this, Chris, is for, for the client, on the client side, this is a multi week experience, right? It's not just, hey, I'm going to see Chris Tuesday at 10. It's, I'm getting things a, a week in advance. I'm getting a follow up call. I'm getting a follow up summary. It's really a multi-week process. Yes. So then on your side, how many are, how tightly are you blocking your surge meetings? How many are you doing in a day or a week? What's kind of that format look like? I love this outline client by client, but kind of as a team as a whole, how does that look? So um, I see clients Tuesday through Thursday, Okay. Um, basically seven meetings a day by, so if this is Zoom, it's seven meetings a day. They're 45 minutes, 15 minutes in between. And, you know, you, you just schedule out. Um, I do do, so I have three offices in different locations that I work out of. Well, and right. so for those, if they're an in-person meeting, um, it's an hour for the meeting with 15 minutes in between. Okay. And um, those are spe specially scheduled days. So two of them ended up being on Fridays, this cycle. Uh, the other two were on Thursdays. It was either extend the cycle or work Friday uh, as far as client meetings. And um, this is the first time I, I had done that in this particular cycle. I didn't uh, love it because I usually use Friday. I, Fridays, I'm typically looking at next week's meetings, making sure everything's squared away, everything the way I want it to be. It gives my staff time to, you know, pull anything together that wasn't. Um, and so a lot of that ended up getting pushed to Monday. I thought I could do it Friday afternoon. It was a disaster both days. So, so you know, I'll, I'll have to figure out something for next uh, next cycle if I decide to do that or not. But uh, I was able to keep it within five weeks, and you know that was a that was a great thing. So this is actually the final week of this cycle. Um, so <laughs> looking looking hard towards Thursday and and uh, going on vacation Thursday night, right? Like just just not what I normally do. But yeah, we're we're packing up in the car. We're going to a theater in Pennsylvania, which is like a seven eight hour drive. And uh, but my son's got the day off from school the next day, so you know, trying to just take advantage of a three day weekend. Yeah, good for you, man. I love that forcing mechanism of why well, I've just got to get it done by this date, and then this is going to force me to get out of the office. Are, are most of your meetings these days via Zoom or how many? Yeah, kind of so um, we sent the invite out to just over 100 clients. Um, I want to say that we're probably about 80 meetings in total. And if I'm thinking about how many were in person, it was probably 10. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So a few, and they cared, but uh, most people pick and zoom and I, that could be a combination of they prefer it generally or just there are a lot more options with zoom right if if you yeah. want in person it's a narrower window of uh of when we can get together and so if that works for you great but if it doesn't um well that's what zoom's for yeah well and i love this idea of physically mailing them the content right we've all had those calls where the client's on their iphone or the internet connection is bad or they just can't see what you're doing so yeah they can physically hold that Deleted the email, can't find uh, the documents yeah. anymore. Yeah, yeah, all of those things, all of those things. Well, Chris, I really love this. I, I appreciate the breakdown. I, in fact, I've even made a whole page of notes here of things that we're going to look on. We've done a lot of follow-up emails with clients, but I really like this idea of a follow-up call. I know that's something that Micah's office does as well. But as we're kind of wrapping up, what are some action items that you would give to to listeners, to all of our fellow advisors who are listening to this and saying, 
boy, I don't know if I could graduate clients or I don't know if I could implement Surge. What are some action items you would give to our listeners? So the probably the thing that's most valuable to me, we didn't even talk about, is just a, uh, a client roadmap, right? Mm -hmm. And so this didn't start with Surge, but once I started doing Surge, I was able to implement this. And basically what I do is I've got listed out through next July, every month, uh, except for December, some point of contact we're supposed to have with clients. And it could be something simple, like we're going to update the uh, the personal balance sheet or a net worth statement. Um, but some of them are, are definitely the surge meetings, so spring and fall. And the 1099 letter in January, yeah. you know, we're doing that. But this, what what I always look for is what's the value you're going to be providing me? And so this gives me confidence. And so if the thing that I would go back and just start with is create a value add calendar and then figure out how to make it happen. And if I had, if I had approached it that way, mm -hmm. I would have realized that I could have niched down my business um, a lot sooner around a service model rather than a type of client particularly, right? You know, it's, it's like if you as a client find value in this set of services, great, we'll be a good fit for each other. And if not, um, hey, you know, I'm not the right guy for you. This is the service I'm providing. So okay. that's what I would do is go to that uh, client roadmap, a value add calendar, that type of a, an idea. Yeah, yeah, that's a great one, a client roadmap calendar. Uh, another action I, I, item I would give, and we mentioned this earlier in the episode, would be to make a list of your clients without names that have those revenue numbers. And if Chris's approach of, hey, my big clients are subsidizing my little clients, if that gets you uncomfortable enough to take action, great, run with that. There are also other ways. That there are other ways of looking at it could be like, hey, am I really willing to jeopardize my firm on a client that's paying me $481 a year because their complaint has just as much damage as the client paying $40,000 a year? So there's a lot of ways to slice that, but it's really saying, hey, wherever I'm at is more uncomfortable than whatever I fear will happen if I go down this other path. Yeah, totally. Perfect. Well, Chris, thank you so much for your time today. Thanks for sharing your story with the TPR Nation and for all of our listeners. Until next time, happy planning. Happy planning.